this is a relatively simple topic. In fact, any of you took any kind of high school physics, you would have done this thing with fluids. Hello fellow YouTubers, this is the first video in a series of videos I hope where I will address several of the misconceptions regarding Bernoulli's principle and its applications. And believe me, there is a lot to be covered. The most discussed misconception I would say is the one regarding lift of an airfoil. If you do a search on the internet, it's not difficult to come across sites that debunk this common misunderstanding, also referred to as the equal transit theory. As you heard the professor just say, fluid dynamics is a relatively simple topic. Well, it's funny that he should say that because the professor's explanation regarding lift of an airfoil is what is referred to as incorrect theory number one on the NASA website that you see here. Obviously, someone has got it terribly wrong. I will refer to the Yale University lecture by Ramamurti Shankar that has been posted on YouTube. It is a bit unfortunate for him as there are so many others to pick from, but he is a university professor in physics, so he will serve as a good example to show the depth of the confusion that there is regarding the Bernoulli's principle. First I will show you a clip from another video where a simple version of the Bernoulli equation is worked out from the law of conservation of energy. Bernoulli's principle states that a total energy is a steadily flowing fluid system is constant along the flow path. Apply the law of conservation of energy. Then substitute the formulas. Divide both sides by volume or V. Or, since V is a constant, since density is equal to mass over volume, rewriting the equation, we can now rewrite the equation as This is all well and good, but you have to remember that this describes a one-dimensional system defined along the flow path of the fluid. One must also remember that it is the internal pressure in the fluid itself that accelerates it to a higher velocity, thus transforming potential energy to kinetic energy. Therefore, the pressure is completely unaffected by the relative velocity to any object that moves parallel to the flow that otherwise doesn't interact with it. And it should not be necessary to mention that Bernoulli's principle does not say anything about any object interacting with the fluid in the first place. So then, let's see if Bernoulli's principle still can be used to explain lift without getting in conflict with any of this. One application of Bernoulli's principle is in aeronautics. The wing of an aircraft is shaped such as the upper surface is longer than the bottom surface. Hence, air has to travel further above the wing, thus having a greater velocity. Greater velocity means lesser pressure. The air beneath the wing has a lesser velocity, so it has greater pressure than the air above the wing. With a low pressure on the top of a higher pressure beneath, this pressure system creates what we call lift. This is clearly the same theory that is disputed by NASA. And interestingly enough, this is the exact same explanation that is given by our professor. This is nothing other than the law of conservation of energy applied to unit volume. If you take one meter cubed of the fluid, its mass is rho times one. So this is really a mass of one cubic meter of the fluid. This is kinetic energy, that's his potential energy, that's the kinetic and that's the potential. So here's another example. Here's an airplane wing. The plane is going like this. It'll go right with the plane, in which case the air seems to be doing this. Far from the plane, everything looks the same as if the wing were not there. But near the wing, this is the flow of air past the wing. Notice that these guys 
above the wing have to travel further than the particles below the wing so they can catch up here where everything is the same. So the velocity on top of the airfoil is faster, therefore pressure is lower. Pressure is lower than in the bottom, then the difference in pressure times the area of the wing will push the wing up. If you find this a bit confusing, I can tell you you're not the only one. Now it turns out this lift theory is actually somewhat naive and I believed it for a long time. Now I know the story is more complicated. There is a lot of truth to this, but it's not the whole story. So if you go into aeronautic engineering one day, you will find out that it's a little more complicated reason, way to calculate the precise lift. But this general notion that when the air moves fast, it loses pressure is true. I would say there is no practical way to explain lift other than by Newton's laws. In this respect, one needs to accept that an airplane is constantly falling in the gravitational fields of the Earth, but it is kept up by constantly diverting air downwards. In any case, it is not being sucked up by any additional effect of the Bernoulli's principle. The lift of an airplane can be explained with the help of two very well-known equations. The force that is needed to provide lift is given by the mass of the air that is diverted downwards and by the speed of the air. The energy that is needed in doing so is given by the equation for kinetic energy. The velocity is squared and this means that uh, it's energy efficient to divert in a large amount of air with low speed rather than a small amount of air with a high speed. And this is the reason why gliders have so long wings. I will show an example that should convince everyone that the equal transit theory simply cannot be correct. Let's imagine a plane flying along at level flight where the lift is supposedly only being provided by the forces at work in according to the equal transit theory. Let's also say that this plane is so super aerodynamic that we can exclude any drag. This means that the plane cut through the air, leaving the air exactly as it was before the plane cut through it. This means that no work has been done on the air molecules. Theoretically, under these premises, this plane should go on flying in a straight line forever, because no work is being done on anything. Alternatively, one can factor in the drag and say that the force provided by the engines exactly matches what is needed to compensate for the drag. What is important to remember is that the equal transit theory does not require any air to be accelerated downwards. That means that no energy has been lost doing so. So then, we have this plane flying along. The weight of the plane is exactly balanced by the lift that the wings provide. That means that the net force in the vertical direction is zero. Now, let's say that an object is dropped from the plane and falls to the ground. This leaves the plane a bit lighter than it was before the object was dropped. Everything else is the same. This means that the force pushing the plane up is slightly greater than the gravitational force pulling the plane down. That means that the plane will start to move upwards in according to Newton's second law. So, if one considers the implications that this has regarding the energy balance, it should be apparent to everyone that the equal transit theory is simply rubbish. From the law of conservation of energy, it follows that no energy can be created out of nothing. So, if you consider the plane before the object was dropped, you see that the plane had a certain kinetic energy represented by its velocity and a certain potential energy as represented by the altitude of the plane. After the object had been dropped, the plane's total kinetic and potential energy is reduced by what is represented by the object, and is therefore fully accounted for in the energy equation. Then all the additional potential energy that is ascribed to the increasing altitude of the plane is totally unaccounted for. That means that this energy has been created out of nothing which is absolutely absurd and impossible. And this means So that's it.
Thank you for your time. I hope you found it interesting. My next video will be about atomizers. So, uh, here's another example. If you have an atomizer, you know, you have a perfume here, and you got a pump, and then you have a tube here. When you squeeze that pump, the instant you squeeze the pump, you're driving a lot of air here at high velocity. Whereas the air here is at rest. So high velocity air has a lower pressure than low velocity air. Therefore, it'll suck the perfume and spray it right on your face. 